Well, hey, Vision. All right, we're glad you're here for part three of this series. Uh, as you know, we do shoot the, uh, the first service on Facebook Live. So I encourage you, if you ever miss it a Sunday, catch it on Facebook Live. And also encourage you, if you truly, if God teaches you something on Sunday morning, hey, go home, find it on the Vision Facebook page and share it on yours, especially this topic today. I guarantee you, it'll get into people's feeds and they'll say, worry, man, I'll, I'll listen to some of that. And God could speak to them just through you doing something simple as sharing our feed on that. We're continuing the series, part three. It's called Christian Atheist, and it's based on this book we're reading by Craig Rochelle, and it is our gift to you if you want to have a copy. I know we are out in the lobby. We're, we're out of books. We, we had a bunch here the first week and went through them, and we got more last week and went through them. So if you want one, stop by the Connection Center afterwards and give us your contact info, just your mailing address and your name, and we will make sure to get you one within a couple of days. Did I make that happen this week? Uh, there was somebody here. I, I did it for you. Yes, we, we, we promise that and we deliver. So if you want a copy of the book, get it. We're reading along with it. Honestly, at your pace. I'll go through five different chapters in the book, including today about worry, but we'll get you one and you read through it at your pace. And I'll see the feedback we're getting on this book is tremendous. I mean, even down to some of our younger teenagers that are reading it all the way up to our oldest people. So I encourage you to be part of that. The verse we've been kind of focusing on for the series comes out of 2 Corinthians. It's this 517 verse that talks about new creation. It says, I was one way and I came to Christ and now I'm, now I'm new. Now I'm different. You know, I've changed. You know, the, the old is gone. The new has come. When we talk about this concept of worry, I wonder sometimes, man, have we really changed that much? I mean, can people see a difference in us because we're following Jesus. And I don't want to just assume that because you're here today, you're following Jesus. If you're new with us and you said, man, I just, I just got invited or I'm just checking it out or I don't even believe in God. Hey, I'm so glad you're here because I want you to investigate God. I want you to put him in a spot where you measure what I say, what he says, and you figure out God. And I think what you hear today will give you some encouragement that God is real and he is on your side. So this topic of worry, you know, throughout time, there's been like this, this spectrum of people that, that are warriors, like number one, or warriors, like number 10, or, you know, Kevin over here taking shoes off and stuff, buying an extra toes and feet, saying, I'm a 10, I'm a 20, I'm worried. I don't believe that. Man, you're too chill for that. You're way too chill. You know, Kevin, we're our students, chill. But seriously, on the spectrum, we've got, you know, on this low end, we got, you know, Bobby McFerrin. If you remember him, he came up with a song that was cute, but so annoying, the Don't Worry, Be Happy. And it would get in your head and like you just, <laughs> you couldn't get out of your head and you're like, I can't sing that anymore. Then you go on the far end of it and you got Charlie Brown. And he says, I developed a new philosophy, you know, I only dread one day at a time. And Charlie was always worrying, always stressing. You're like, am I Bobby? Am I Charlie? Am I somewhere in between? And I see the reality is we're all somewhere in between. I don't have this figured out and I'm betting you don't have it figured out. So today we talk about worry. Let me start off reading something real quick. From, uh, from Craig's book, you know, Craig Rochelle, pastor of Life Church out west in Midwest, and I love his book he's written. He says, I know I'm not supposed to worry. I try not to worry, but sometimes it's hard. Worry is bad for our health. In fact, our word worry derives from the old high German worgen, literally to strangle, constrict, and choke. I mean, really, do you ever feel like that when you're worrying? You're like, man, something, something is like strangling me. Something's like choking me. I feel like I can't get out of this. He says, that's, that sounds like worry feels, doesn't it? Worry absolutely strangles the life out of me. But there are just so many things to worry about. How can I stop? When there's, when there's nothing to worry about, I worry about that. Uh-oh, things are too good right now. The other shoe's about to drop. And since worry is bad for my health, I worry about that. How do I stop? Christian atheists can always find something to worry about. You're like, Matt. This is my first time here. What are you talking about, Christian atheists? That's like such an opposition to each other. It's really taking a look at a Christian faith that we believe, but do we really live it out? We say here on Sunday, yeah, God, you're real. God, I believe you. God, you're a warrior. You're in charge of things. And then we hit Monday and our faith just crumbles and things happen to make us worry. And we're like, God, I, I, I believe in you, but I, I guess I'm not really living like it. How do I change? I don't want to be like a Christian atheist. How do I do this? Well, that gets us to today's question of how do we deal with worry? Now, I want you to pick up your orange card. You got one on your chair there, and I, I'm actually going to offer you a trade today. If you would take that orange card and sometime during my message, write down 
something or some things you worry about. If it's private, you, and you fold it over. If you need two cards, you fill them out. You put your worry on there. And at the end, when we have our response song, you're going to have a chance to trade it for something I believe that God can put in your hands that can be of great value to you. So when we talk about this concept of worry, I prayed this week and said, God, how can I, how can I show this through visuals? Because I hear all the time from people, particularly our new ones, they almost apologetically say, man, I like the way you teach. I'm a visual learner. And I'm like, really, we, we all are. As I love when, with our kids back there, they get all kinds of visuals. Back there in, in Trailblazer, I mean, Trailblazer in First Sight, they got visuals. Tonight with our students, visuals. So what we got today, I prayed about it. I said, God, how do you want me to show this so that people will walk away with a visual of what we're talking about with worry? And I want you to understand that in our minds, worry weighs us down to where you know, we, we worry about our finances and relationships and you know, cancer and scared about this and scared about our young drivers and, and all these things weigh us down. And we say, God, how can I possibly find a way to find something that outweighs that to where I can get victory over the weight I feel from my worry? So if you'll stick with me, I think you'll see that, that what God's going to show us in this is going to give us great hope in how we can deal with the reality of worry, because God is not saying it's going to go away. Jesus never said it would go away. He said, don't worry. He said, worrying can't add an hour to your life. He said, let's deal with it. It's not going to go away. It's going to be there. So I got four things about this question about how does God want us to deal with worry? The first one is do our part. Do our part. So repeat after me. Do our part. Okay, now what I'm talking about here is that physically... When something is bothering you, you can do something about it. It's, it's like, say you're looking for a job. You're like, man, I'm, I'm out of work. I need a job. And I say, well, are you, have you put together a resume? Are you applying for jobs? You know, are you telling people? Are you networking? Have you got like at least one nice outfit you can wear to go for interviews? Are you doing your part? You're saying, man, I'm so stressed about money. Oh my goodness, it's, it's just consuming me. So well, do, you, do you know really, really how much is coming in? Do you know how much is going out? Do you know where it's going out? Is there anything you can trim and start working on that if you're going to pray and say, God, help me with the money problem, and God's first going to say, do your part. He's going to say, look, you, you want to get healthier? Do your part. You got something going on even physically? No, I'm not even going to the doctor. I'm not even going to check it out. No, do your part and do something physically to deal with that worry, and then God will do his part. Because what I see in here where there's physically... And there's prayerfully. And again, I'm not just throwing prayer at it and saying, well, the pastor just said to pray more and you'll worry less. I'm not discounting prayer. I'm saying it's a piece of the equation. The second piece I'll read in here says, <clears throat> if you do catch yourself worrying, even after you've done what was wise, remember that God is bigger than our problems. Now here at Vision, we talk a lot about wisdom. It's actually one of our basic truths there about make the wise choice that when you're faced with that financial concern, you're faced with that medical or that relational concern, wisdom is a gift God will give you. There's a whole book in the Bible called Proverbs that talks about wisdom, the value of wisdom, of literally seeing all the different choices and knowing, okay, that's the best way. That's the path I should take. Wisdom will be God's gift to you. So what he's saying here is after you've done everything that was wise, remember, God is bigger than our problems and that he wants us to hand them over to him. Worry then becomes a signal, alerting us that it's time to pray. Anytime you hear the alarm start to blare, stop. It's time to stop worrying and it's time to start praying. So if you have something you're worried about, you say, okay, this is on my mind. It's on my heart. It's in my stomach. What am I going to do? God says, first of all, do your part, do the things you can do, and then prayerfully come and talk to me about it. Literally, with prayer, God's saying, come and tell me how you're feeling. And this isn't a, God, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of worried about money. This is a, God, I am scared that we're going to run out of money. They're going to take my house. God wants to hear your heart poured out, and he wants to speak back into you. So in a moment of prayer, knowing that you're speaking out and God is willing to speak back, this is the first thing you can do is your part. Number two, get help from friends. Get help from friends. So repeat after me. Get help from friends. Get help from friends. 
And you're like, well, man, I, I don't have any friends. Okay, well, we want to help you with that. Literally, our church is here to help you find people to go on this journey with. So the first thing I'd say about that is we got to get you some Christian friends. It's great to have friends in the world. It's great to have friends even that are far from God because we are not trying to segregate ourselves from the world. We're trying to be in the world and build friendships with people far from God so they can see something different in us. But in those moments when you're dealing with worry, you need somebody who is on the same wavelength as you about God, who is thinking about eternity, who's thinking about the power of God. Your non-Christian friends can't do that. So when you're stressed out, anxious, you need some people around you that also love Jesus and will speak into you. So again, you say, well, Matt, how, how do I do that? Well, Proverbs 12, I love this verse. It says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. You know, that first half of that verse, we could all relate to that. That anxiety weighs down your heart. You know, this past week, if you felt any anxiety and you felt it weigh you down, you felt it in your stomach, you felt it in your bones, you said, I need some help with that. I need some relief from that. Well, this, this kind word that's being spoken of in Proverbs, this book of wisdom, makes you understand this kind word is not necessarily coming from your pastor because I can only give so much of a personal word to you as a roomful, or you can't just get it online from somebody you watch or you listen to or even a book you read. You have to be eyeball to eyeball with somebody who's going to look into your life and say, hey, you're going to make it. Hey, let's get you some help. Hey, let's figure this out. Hey, things were bad and got better and they're bad and they're going to get better. You need a friend who will be that close to you personally to speak a kind word to cheer you up. So how could that happen? You can get into a small group. In fact, we've got a new family in our community just coming here. We helped them uh, do some things at our house recently and they said, oh man, we can't wait to start coming to Vision. We've even got a room. It's going to be great for small group. I'm like, yes. Man, I love hearing that because they believe in the value of small group. And now if you say, man, that's, that's too big of a step. I can't maybe jump into someone's house yet. Well, then come on Tuesday night. This Tuesday at 7, we meet right here. We have a small group that talks about this book. We've had anywhere from 10 to 30 people that come out. We talk about it. We break up into small groups. You don't have to share all your, your life story, all your dirty stuff. You just come on in and start building some friendships. And God will take that to pour into your life through other people. Tina, is it worth it? It's been great on Tuesdays. So I'm inviting you to come to a small group. If you say, man, man that's not my thing yet. I say, well, then how about serving? What if you find your spot here at Vision? And you say, okay, I'll, I'll be a greeter or I'll work with the kids or I'll work in a parking lot or production. You might not know this, but every Sunday morning, our host teams gather in the lobby and they talk, and they laugh, and they cut up, and they say, what can we pray for you about? And sometimes I'll be walking past, and someone will say, oh, man, I got some bad news from the doctor this week. And you will feel compassion in that circle as they care for each other. So understand, they're doing more than just accomplishing ministry or doing a job. They're not just parking cars and greeting people. They are caring for each other. So if you'd say, man, I want to try that. I'd like to test drive either serving or a small group you stop by the Connection Center after the service. We'll get your name. We'll have somebody contact you and give you a chance to make some friends that will help you. But the last piece of this, make sure you get this, is you got to be a friend if you want to get a friend. So if you come Tuesday night and you're like, ah, that was good. I enjoyed it. And the rest of the week, nobody even texted me. Nobody even liked my Facebook posts. Nobody said nothing to me. I said, wait a second. Maybe you should send somebody a text. Maybe you should get on somebody's page and say, hey, that's really cool. And you be a friend to get a friend. Now, as, as your pastor, my job is to challenge and encourage you. There's two sides to this. So, so here's my challenge. If you've been here more than a couple months and you don't have any friends here at Vision, that's on you. That's on you. Because we work hard to create systems to help you meet people here because we know the value of it. I say that in love because we're here open-handed and say we want to help. If you stop by the Connection Center, we'll help you to do this to get help from friends. Now, before we hit the third point, 
I'm going to bring somebody up here, and we're going to, we're going to talk about worry. Now, you know, I, I interview people from time to time, and as I was heading to this one, I thought, okay, who, who can I bring up here that, man, they've just got worry figured out. You know, they, they, they're not bothered by it. They can speak into this. They can encourage you. And it was like God said to me, nah, that's not who people want to hear from. People want to hear from somebody who struggles with this. People want to hear from somebody who's on this journey and is trying to get it and sometimes gets it and sometimes struggles. And I said, okay, I, I got somebody great in mind. So if you would welcome Alice Delana to come up on stage. So Alice, come on up. And Alice is one of our visionaries here. Been here for what, about two years? And if you say, I could never get on stage and talk, that's Alice too. She would say, I could never get on stage and talk. But somehow, me and God convinced her to uh, come up here and share. So Alice, thank you, thank you. Now, Alice has been here about two years. You can see some of her family up on the screen. Her husband, Gary, and it's cool because with Gary, outside of his day job, his side work, he gets to drive the Zamboni for the Charlotte Checkers. That is, that's really cool. And then we get to see uh, their daughter, Ashley, who uh, uh, she works odd shifts. I know she's here some Sundays or not. You said she was sleeping this morning because she worked last night. But uh, love your family. And I love that you have allowed yourself to come up on stage and be a part of what we're doing. So thank you, Alice. So let's dig in. Um, first of all, Alice, so how well do you deal with worry? What, what, was, what was your number? You said an eight? Okay, you're an, you're an eight, so tell us, how, how well do you deal with worry? I don't deal with it very well. That's why my family calls me the queen of worry. <laughs> the queen of worry, okay. So um, tell us about like some things you've been through or current stressors in your life that have caused you to kind of tend to worry more. Um, well, about 24 years ago, um, my first husband was a police officer, and he was killed in the line of duty. Um, before that time, I didn't worry, or I don't remember worrying, but since that time, I tend to worry a lot more. Um, I, I worry about um, when my husband, my current husband, travels, um, or my daughter. Of course, she's going; she'll be graduating on Friday from paramedic school, so she's out there as well. Um, I actually talked her out of being a law enforcement officer because that's what she wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to um, family nurse practitioner school, so I worry about school. And well, in addition I to your full time job, right? In addition to my full time job. Yes. So definitely a lot of things coming on to you. Uh, but how about, tell us what role does prayer or friends or scripture, what does that play in helping you deal with worry? Um, I have several ladies here in the church that um, I was in small group with and I text them um, or I, t I have some really close friends that I text. Um, of course, my husband tries to um, help me see the uh, other side of it um, and calm me down a little bit. Okay. Now, Alice, and, I pray. and you pray, absolutely. And, and I love what I see God doing in Alice's life the last couple of years. Uh, she is, I mean, incredible volunteer part of our team, so detailed. She, she fixes a lot of the, uh, the gaps that <laughs> a lot of our teams have. You're so, you're just a great part of our team. So what I want to do is um, I'm going to continue my message and then utilize Alice for part of our visual over here. So number three in your notes is tip the scales, tip the scales. So repeat after me. Tip the scales. Because when we look at these scales and we think about how the, the weight of our worry is just throwing this thing off. And I know how that feels when worry in my life is just way out of balance and I can't figure out how to get it back. How do we deal with it? Well, in Colossians 3, this guy Paul was writing to Christians in the early church and he said, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now you think about that phrase that we all have something or someone that we will let rule in our hearts. Some days it's worry, some days it's stress, some days it's selfishness, some days it's pain, it's fear, whatever it is. But Paul says, hey, let one thing rule in your hearts, the peace of Christ. Let it have the top spot. He, he's not minimizing saying, look, I, I, I know you had something bad happen this week. I mean, like, for example, a, a friend of mine, his wife, I found out this week she's got cervical cancer. And when I talked to him the other day, I did not minimize that at all and say, that doesn't matter, Kevin. I said, man, that matters a lot. That is heavy. And I said, even in that moment, the peace of Christ can still ruin your heart. And we'll say, how? Well, let's keep looking. Because since as members of one body, you were called to peace. I love this, that you know, at Vision, you know, we're a body, but we're just a part of the bigger body of Christ. So literally, Paul is saying, 
if you call yourself a Christian and you're part of the body of Christ, you weren't called to anxiety. You weren't called to tension and fear and danger. He said, life is still going to bring you tough stuff. In fact, Jesus said, you're going to encounter tough, terrible things. But as a body, we are called to peace. That's part of our journey. When we walk with God, there's a peace there. It says, be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. Now that word admonish, pretty strong. I'm going to come back to that here in a second. You admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So Alice, let's talk about this word admonish. Because Alice didn't know ahead of time that I was going to admonish her up on stage. And you're like, oh no, I'm definitely never going to get on stage, Pastor Matt, now. Because when you think of admonish, you're thinking, that I, got, I got three different definitions I found. You're thinking of the first one. It says to warn or reprimand someone firmly. You're like, yeah, that's what I did with my kids this week. That's what I did with my teenager this week. I admonished them. They came in too late or they didn't do their chores. I don't think Paul is talking about that here. The second definition to, is to advise or urge someone earnestly. That I would say to Alice, Alice, I'm urging you with, with an earnestness to me that I, I believe what I'm selling here. I believe what I'm telling here. I believe that there is a way for peace to rule in our hearts. And the third definition, to warn someone of something to be avoided. And actually, Alice, let's, let's walk over here. This, this visual here, again, is showing, we'll say it's, it's going to show Alice's worry. So Alice, you know, go ahead and using the rocks as an example that when you feel stressed about, okay, you have Gary's safety and that you toss it on there, of Ashley's safety, of how you're going to make school and time and everything work, how finances are going to work out. You, all these things pile in there. And I would say, well, then I need to admonish you. Trust me, God doesn't come over here and say, shame on you, Alice. I'm so mad at you. God walks over and through me or through a friend says, well, let me warn you. It doesn't have to be like this. Yes, you're still going to have these different things in your life, but God is saying, I want to outweigh that. Now, this, this was pretty cool. As we tried to find a visual, like a bucket we could use for God, don't you love we found one in Vision Blue? So, Alice, I believe God says, yes, you, you got all that, but, you know, when you take, you know, people and verses and help, you know, that, that does work against it, but you say, man, it's, it's not enough. It's just not enough. And God says, you're right, it's not enough. You need to take all those things and the weight and the value and the power of them, and he says, put them in me because me as comparison to your worries, it dominates. I got it. And I want you in this visual to see that as Alice stands here and says, look, these, these things still matter. Oh, they still matter. They're still heavy. But no matter what it is, if it's cancer, if it is, you guys declare bankruptcy. I mean, whatever it is, God's saying, I'm bigger than it. He is not minimizing it. He is not saying cancer doesn't matter. Bankruptcy doesn't matter. But he's saying, without me, it's totally going to weigh you down. With me, peace can rule in your heart. All right, so let's thank Alice for being up here. Because I, I love what I found on Facebook about a week ago from one of our teenagers. And if you've uh, heard it all about the, the show on Netflix called uh, 13 Reasons Why, it's a show about why you would kill yourself. Why would you commit suicide? And a teenager in our church, she was sitting there one day and said, wait a second. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot on this side. But no, I, I'm saying 13 reasons why not. And she, she posted this. And when I saw this, I said, Victoria, that's amazing. 13 reasons why not. And if you want to find that, you see the last name, McCatherine, you can go on Mike McCatherine's Facebook page and find Victoria's image on there where she said, I'm not minimizing life and the fears of being a teenager. I'm just focusing on this side. That's what I'm going to do. So that leads us to number four. 
Number four, the way to deal with worry is to lean on Scripture. To lean on Scripture. So repeat after me, lean on Scripture. Okay, you got the, you know, these orange cards. And I'm offering you a trade today. And what we're going to trade for, and you know they got to be vision blue, of course, are these cards. Because these cards each have a verse on each side. So what you have here are 12 verses. And these verses, I'm going to go through most of these here in a second. These verses is what God takes to implant in us the truth of who He is. Don't miss this. These are not, whether on this card or in your Bible or on your phone, these are not letters on a page. This is literally the voice of God spoken to you. Eternal truths that God said, I'm going to speak through a person and put it down on paper so that I can tell you great news. That God says, believing in me, but living as if I don't exist. He said that you're totally missing out. So I was thinking this week about this concept of, of believing that, but not living like. And I was like, okay, God. So say my wife, Meg, believing that, that, that I love her, believing that I want her to feel like the most special woman in the world, but at times not living like I love her, not, not living like she feels like the most special woman in the world. You'd say, man, there's, there's a disconnect. Believing that, I want to get healthy. Talked to a guy in the first service. He's lost 15 pounds this year. I thought, man, I want some of that. I want to do that. And he might say, well, Matt, you, you, you say that. <laughs> you say you're believing like you want to be healthy, but you're eating all those brownies. You're coming to ignition, and you're bumping them out of the way and eating all the brownies. He said, Matt, something's not connecting here. And God says the same thing with your walk. Are you believing in me but not living like I exist? Am I believing that God's my helper, but not living like God's my helper? Because, you know, it says in Hebrews 13, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? You say, well, Matt, you don't know my boss. Matt, you don't know the pain I have with my spouse or that other person or the person stressing me out. I said, wait a second. What can mere mortals do to you? God is your helper. I'm not minimizing what's happening. I'm just focusing on him. Believing that God has got me covered, but not living like it says in Psalm 91.4 that God's got me covered. It says, he'll cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you'll find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. Meg went this past week to go get some, some bunnies. You know, we love animals around our house. So she took the kids, they went to go get some bunnies, and at this place they also had chickens. And there was this one chicken sitting there, kind of a little bit weird looking sitting, and she's like, what's up with that chicken? And they went over there, and they lift up the wing, and there was a little baby chick under there. And, you know, that baby chick wasn't worried about life. That baby chick was believing that it was covered with the feathers of that mama. And God says, I got you. I got you. Whatever's coming your way, I got you covered. Are we going to believe that, or are we going to live like that? Believing that God is for me, but not living like God is for me. What about Romans 8.31? He said, hey, if God's for us, who could be against us? Truly. Whatever's coming up here, I got it. I am for you, says God. So who can be against you? Who can possibly outweigh what I can do in your life? Believing that I can cast my cares on God, but not living like I can cast my cares on God. That's Alice's verse. That's 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, you can cast your cares on Christ because he cares for you. And you get in your week and say, man, I can't cast this one on him. He said, no, man, this, this one's too big. I can't do it. He says, well, are you believing it? Or are you really living it? Cast those, and I'll take it. I'll do it. Believing that God will give me peace, but not living like God will give me peace. 2 Thessalonians says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. In fact, you'll see it's the first verse on here because he wants you to have peace. He wants you to have it at all times. When you get cancer and say, this stinks, I say, you can still have peace. You might not be happy. You might be crying. I'll be right there crying with you. And when I got cancer, you'll be there crying with me. But I'll say, the God of peace said I can have peace. 
And that cancer isn't bigger than my God. Believing that God gives me hope as the anchor for my soul, but not living like God gives me hope as the anchor for my soul. In, in Hebrews 6, it talks about God as an anchor. I mean, you get that visual of a boat in a storm that's going to be torn to pieces. God says, no, there's an anchor that will hold you no matter what your storm is. You've got that on the card. Believing that God is with me, but not living like God is with me. I love Isaiah 46. It says, do not fear, for I'm with you. Don't be dismayed, for I'm your God. I'll strengthen you and help you. You say you feel alone. You feel discouraged. You feel unmotivated. Say, God is with you. Live like it this week. That's a promise he gave you in Isaiah. It's there. Believing that God can make me strong and courageous, but not living like he can make me strong and courageous. This guy, Joshua, he was facing an incredible danger, battle, fear in front of him. He said, God, I can't do it. God said, what do you mean you can't do it? He said, have I not told you that I'm with you? Have I not told you to be strong and courageous? In fact, I've commanded you to do it. And sometimes we need to hear that and be strong and courageous. And the last one, believing that God's my rock, my salvation, my fortress, but sometimes just not living like it says in Psalm 62, that God is my rock, my fortress, my salvation. You say, it's all shifting. It's all falling. I can't stand up. He said, he's, he's your rock. He's your rock. Now, with these cards, here's where the trade's going to come in. When we have our response song today, I want you to take your orange card. If you need to be secret and fold it or whatever you need to do, and you're going to have a chance to bring it up here and trade it. Because these cards, these blue ones, there's 12 verses. There's six cards with a verse on each side. And they're all about dealing with worry. And they might be for you. And they might be for somebody you got to give it to at work this week. They might be for somebody you got to give to at school this week. They might be for somebody at the grocery store that you just happen to have one in your purse, your pocket. And they're there. They're saying, man, I'm, I'm so stressed out. My kid did this or my something did this. And you're like, now, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way, and you give it to them. And it's, it's got the Vision logo on it, so, you know, you don't, you don't have to do a big sales job. Come to Vision with me. Here's the times. Here's whatever. You just give them the card. And if they want to know where you're finding your peace, they, they go on Facebook. They go on our website. You invite them. Whatever you want to do, this is your chance to share hope with somebody in peace. Now, before I finish, I want to talk about the concept of an altar. Because in the Bible, an altar was often built to commemorate an encounter with God that had a profound impact on somebody. That when you step out of a seat and walk forward and put something in a box, you're literally saying, God, I'm coming to your altar because I believe this will do something. I'm coming to make an exchange of my worries for your hope. An altar usually represented a person's desire to consecrate themselves, literally to, like to be refined, to be, to be used for something holy and valuable and powerful. And I think God's saying that to you, saying, I want to do that in you. I want you to be consecrated for me. And I want us to realize that every human heart also has an altar in it, and something's on that altar. Selfishness, fear, power, money, greed, and God's saying, I want to be on that altar. So in a moment, when we have this song, you can bring your card and you can trade it in. And Alice will be over here passing these out for you to take. And if you want more time at the altar, you come down here and take a knee. People did in the first service. They just took a knee and just soaked in the song. So we sing about this coming to the altar I want you to remember, believing in God but still worrying is a terrible way to live. God wants to make a trade with you, so lay down your worries and he'll give you peace.